It says setting up your meeting for custom streaming service. Well, oh, okay. so. <laughs> and yeah, I don't even know where we went. Where'd you go? I'm here. Yeah, I can't see you at all. Really? Yeah, I'm on YouTube now. <laughs> You're on YouTube? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I really don't know where we went. So I may have to do this without... Uh, yeah. Oh no, it's like that one time when I came over and we lost yeah. it. But it was on the same page. I'm probably just behind the window. Oh, maybe. Yeah, um, potentially. I may just do this without being able to see myself and that might be okay too, right? That works. Yeah, well, I can just tell you if anyone... on Facebook. I just want to make sure we're appearing live on Facebook where we should be and then... Because I don't need to look at myself. I know what I look like, right? Yeah. Uh, sure, sure. Do you like this groovy music, though? Yeah, I like it. It's good. It's good. It's huh? very, like, wine-tasting events. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's this great jazz thing. Yeah, it's really good. So, yeah, I can't see. I can't see, but that's okay. So, how you been doing, Madeline? Um, I've been good. Have you been um, wine lately? I actually haven't had any wine lately, but um, I my background has some wine. Oops, can you see it? I can't. Oh yes. Oh, good choice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's really good. Yeah. Very nice. Um, um I have a couple of you of... are streaming as well, but there I you are. Just I see found it you. Zoom, so I'll just stay I here. Me. I found myself now. We start talking about wine and somehow I find myself. <laughs> oh yes, I love it. You have a giant glass, that's like a giant glass back there. Scoot, can you scoot to your, I guess it would be your left for a moment. It looks like a big aquarium of wine. <laughs> mm. I'm gonna pour myself some water because I say all the time, and I said it last time and I'll say it this time and I'll say it next time. <laughs> Stay hydrated when you're when you're drinking wine, because you can enjoy it a lot more. Um, if you're not schnockered. One glass makes you a poet. Yeah, I've always Aww. I've always been told to equalize the water with the amount of wine that you drink. Yes, it's a it's really a good choice. Yeah. And I used to when I used to really work in the wine world, we'd have to do a lot of tasting, and you know you see people spitting all the time. But sometimes the wine is really good, and you don't want to spit because you really do get the full experience when you can taste it. Yeah. Um, so it was a lot. It was a lot of water. A lot of water. So I have some notes here, and I'll try to kind of stick to them. But you know me, it's like. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. And, yeah, and like we can always do stuff next time if you don't get to something. Yes. So yeah, there's anyway. always time for there's always time for more wine. I don't know if you remember last week, but I had this bottle last week, and we talked about it. It's from Bone. It's yes. a yeah. It's a it's from Bone. Bone is in Burgundy, or as we say here en français, uh, Bourgogne, and. Uh, uh, this yeah. is also, yeah, this is also a, a Burgundy, um, and it's from, Burgundy's not really that huge of an area, so they're kind of from around the same sort of neighborhood, and they're both the same year, but I thought it would be really fun to do like a little side-by-side -side tasting and just see, you know, what the difference can be with really essentially the same kind of wine but in the hands of a different winemaker or maybe a little bit of a different microclimate type situation so hmm. do you know what a microclimate is no i actually don't so a micro oh y'all know what a climate is but in a within a wine growing region you can have little microclimates and usually wine grapes grow best in kind of some varied terrain. So um, within Burgundy, I don't know if you've been, but when you drive through Burgundy, um, you have some kind of rolling gentle hill areas. You have some really jutty, craggy kind of more um, 
stone-like outcroppings with vineyards on them, terraced vineyards. You have some more flat areas. You have some higher areas. And so all of these different elevations and different terrain create microclimates. So generally speaking, that's why, and that's why both Chardonnay and Pinot Noir are just the perfect, um, the perfect grape varietals for Burgundy. Uh, both of those grapes do really, really well when it gets nice and sunny and hot during the day. Uh, and then at night cools off really significantly. So that's what keeps a really good profile with some good fruit, strong fruit, uh, and then also a good uh, acidity, which was, is really ideally what you want in a, in a burgundy especially, but that's good with food and whatnot. So this, <laughs> oh, where are my glasses? Ah, there we go. This is what I get for. So, I don't wear these often. I try, I try to not look as, <laughs> as smart as I really am. All right. So I'm going to say it uh, on, fr on French. Bourgogne passe du grand. So its appellation is, um, it, that's the appellation. So for this wine, it's a little bit more classic. They're actually putting the appellation here. And it's a pretty small appellation. Um, this wine, the alcohol content is 12.5. If I remember correctly, I think this one was 13. Yep, 13. It doesn't sound like a huge difference, but I already kind of am, am formulating some opinions what I think the difference might be in these two. Um, what I think, without really, really knowing, because I don't know the winemaker, I don't know the viticulturist, like I don't know who grew the grapes and decided when they were going to pick them, but um, most likely this one may be coming from a little bit of a higher up, um, higher area so it didn't quite get as uh, as much sugar content in the in the uh, grapes and so therefore it ended up with a little bit lower alcohol or they maybe picked it sooner than this one because sugar content is what causes um potential for really higher alcohol wines so uh let me give you a, i just cut the capsule i really wish you were being able to taste this with me madeline yeah, that would be so fun. I'll have to ship you, um, I'll have to give you like a delivery, a, a wine delivery. I'll, whatever wine I'm tasting, I'll, I'll make sure to deliver it to, you, <laughs> to your place ahead of time. This is an articulated wine key, so sometimes it's fine with me. I have some good cheese here, and I'll talk about this little, this little pairing that I think is going to work. Um, so you ever see people, I don't know, I don't know if you've seen this. This is kind of an old school thing, maybe my age. Have you ever seen... Uh, in a restaurant or at home, uh, the, the server or sommelier <laughs> pulls the cork out and, and, you know, basically hands the cork to the, uh, to the person that ordered. And then they, they go, no. they, sm they smell the cork. Yeah, that's a very old school thing. So I would have to withhold every time I saw someone sniffing the cork, I wanted to go, smells like cork, eh? <laughs> <laughs> you don't really get much of yeah, why? Why would they smell the cork? Have you ever heard the term of a wine being cork? Yeah. As in, it's like it's a fault. So um, sometimes you'll taste a wine, and when it uses a natural cork like this, literally like a cork that came off of a tree, sometimes there's a, a fungus in there. Mm -hmm. And it makes the wine smell kind of like wet dog or like wet cardboard. Oh. Yeah, it's not uh -huh. a good thing. And I, I can smell that from a mile away. Some things I can't, I'm not a super taster or anything, but some things I can't, I can't smell, I can't pick up or as easily, but that, that I can smell. It's pretty gnarly most of the time. And it's really a bummer when you have, um, when you have a wine that you've spent a fair amount of money on and saved it for a while. Um, when it's corked because it's just it's just the ruination of it it's just terrible so sometimes so something you can take as well yes yes and, uh. and it varies sometimes more than um more than others so i'm going to swirl this around again i didn't actually get a chance i have my really good glasses back in the united states um and i haven't had a chance to to get any here which i, I had intended to do but i'll have, hopefully have it by next week this will this will serve the purpose but what you really want to do when uh, when you pour your wine, you want to really get it going, like just swirl the hell out of it. Um, and this actually Ooh, it that looks so cool. 
Isn't that cool? So you can do it. You can be really safe about it if you have a table and you can kind of do it on the table like this. Um, but you're actually, you're, you're aerating these volatile esters, and, which are like the alcoholic compounds. And you're like just really aerating and causing all the, um, the aromas, the aromatic molecules to move over. So that's what brings it kind of up and you can stick your nose in it. Ooh, ooh. Ooh, I like that. All right, I'm going to take a glass. <laughs> oh my God, I'm coming over right now. Come over right now. I'll talk the whole time. And by the time you get here, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's really nice. So what I what noticed. What does it smell like? So to me, it smells a little bit like candied cherry. And a little bit like, uh, when I say purpley flower, like violet or something like that, which it has this really bright, you know, like when you have cherries, there's Bing cherries, there, there are the light, like the whiter light cherries, and then there's real dark cherries. This is like a real bright one. Oh, this is, this is a, I can tell you what, I, well, let's see, let's see the follow up before I say too much. <laughs> I like it. So the first the first dip is not usually the Ooh, really good one. It's okay. when you just pop it. Yeah. So, um, and it's a, it's a really young, it's a pretty young wine and it's not a high end wine. I won't even say how much it costs yet. Um, sometimes it actually, <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to divulge quite yet, but I actually will. If, if anybody has any questions, um, Oh, well, hello. We have a quick, we have, um, somebody saying hi to us on Facebook. She said, hello beauties. I'm gonna ask her if she's a wine lover. Uh, she's a wine. I think she's probably a wine lover. It's Tony. But I can't. Yeah, she's a wine lover. Hey, Tony, are you a wine lover? Um, so what I notice a lot of times with younger wines, um, they benefit from a little time open with a little a little aeration on their own, or you can decant them. Um, decanting a lot of times people think is just for very old wines where there's a lot of sediment at the bottom and usually you want to decant um, just to make sure that the sediment stays at the bottom and you can kind of pour freely. Um, there's a whole, maybe if, if, it, if it ends up being where I can get a hold of a nice little bottle of wine or, or I can get, I can decant, I can show you a couple of different ways to decant. It's kind of a really fun pomp and circumstance situation that like if you're at a nice dinner with someone and you decant a wine, it, even if you don't have to decant it, sometimes just the act of doing it is, it's just, it just makes the evening feel really special, makes the dinner feel really special. And it's a, it's a good, I think it's a good um, wine tool belt thing. You know, you'd be, you can know how to decant a wine. So, um, so I didn't, and so what would be nice is to see and mm -hmm. taste how this wine develops over the course of probably, it'll take a few days to probably drink it, but. Mm. It has a fair amount of tannins. And tannins, I don't know if you're familiar, tannins are what, when you drink, uh, they're really only in red wine because it comes from the skins and the pits and the stems a lot of times. It's that feeling you get if you ever bite into a walnut and you get that like astringent where it makes your teeth kind of rub together or tea. When oh, you yeah. Yeah, when you if you drink tea, do you drink black tea at all? Yeah, I drink tons of tea. I thought you might. Um, you're yeah. the studious smart type and, you, in, and you're a writer, so of course you drink tea. Um, but you know when you steep your oh, tea? I'm just English. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's true. I, that's true, actually, right? Your, your father is, is British, yes? Mm -hmm, yes, okay, that's where exact. It comes from. Oh, you were raised properly then. Very nice. So... Mm. <laughs> Um, so when you steep your tea too long, you get that kind of a dry flavor, that astringent kind of, that pulls out of the leaves. So it's the same thing. And it can come across a little bit as vegetal sometimes, but it's actually one of the, one of the uh, building blocks of being able to age a wine is having tannins. So this wine does, it's a little chewy, I'll call it chewy sometimes, but it's very well balanced. I, it's not a super complex wine, but it has a, a nice amount going on. And I could tell it'd be really good with like a French preparation of duck, maybe with duck with plums 
and maybe some of the red wine if you wanted to make a, a like a sauce or chutney with the plums that kind of thing but that good meatiness from the duck it has a little bit of wildness to it just a little bit french wines a lot of times um more than let's say wines in that are uh, new world like the united states these can these tend to be have a little more earthiness to them and earthiness literally is almost like if you think of wood earth dirt brick that kind of thing so it's a it's 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 a little bit like a foot in the old How world. do they develop those different tastes? So a lot of it happens. Uh, yeah, how do they dry. develop those different tastes? So what's interesting about these tastes, so most of the time when you're tasting something, it actually, it's an olfactory thing. So it does come from what you're smelling. That's why when you have a cold, just don't even bother to drink wine because you can't really fully taste it. Um, so it's you smelling. So what it is, is, oh. yeah. So people will wonder, they'll say, I don't, under, I don't understand. When I first started enjoying wine or tasting it, I would watch people and they'd say, oh, it's a plum, blackberry, bramble, saddle leather. And I'm thinking, did they, did they put saddle leather in this? Like, I don't understand. Are they adding things? To the <laughs> <laughs> did they put a, yeah. you know, like a... Um, oh my God. In the, I mean, like, it just, I didn't want to ask, of course, because I don't want to seem like I was an idiot, but it was just ignorant really more than anything. But so what it is, is basically when you're, when you're smelling a wine, um, they, they don't add anything to it, but flavor or uh, aroma molecules, there are only so many of them in, in nature. So when you're smelling something, it's the same kind of um, aromatic molecules that are in other things. So when they combine, a lot of times you'll smell that, oh, it smells like cranberry. It's, oh, it smells like, it smells like kind of an herb of some sort, or I'm tasting this, it tastes sort of like a uh, green pepper or like cigar. It's because, I mean, aroma molecules are aroma molecules. And so you're gonna, you know, you're gonna pull those things out. Wait till we get to the champagne, uh, the champagne day. That is, that is like a brilliant day. I'm waiting for a very special time for that. I'm not exactly sure when, but. And also, by the way, if anybody has a request of any kind of um, a wine situation you want me to engage in with you here on this live event, I'm totally open to um, any suggestions or anything like that. But now I'm gonna open this other bottle and do a little side by side. You're gonna have to remind me, Madeline, as per usual um, of time, because I'll just go on and on and on and on. So, okay. So, I mean, we're yeah. doing good right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, do when that. you open a wine bottle, <laughs> when you open a wine bottle, how long do you have to drink the bottle before it like gets ruined? I guess. Super good question. By the air. Yeah. So super good question, and it's it's actually a pretty complicated answer. So I have found. There are all these different kinds of tricks and different products that you can buy. And, you know, there are gases that you can, you know, squirt in the bottle and put the top on and the gas is supposed to just kind of float around on the top. And there it's like varying degrees of success that I have encountered with that. What seems to work best is get to know wine and get to understand the components of wine. Generally speaking, the more simple the wine, um, the, the less time you really have to drink it. I always put it in the refrigerator, even if it's a red, I put it in the refrigerator afterward because that will retard the oxidization because the oxidation is what ruins, essentially ruins the wine. So if you have a wine that's been open for too long, and you and you taste it it'll taste almost like a like a penny like if you were to like you can oh. yeah so because pennies are copper so it's almost like this oxidization or like i don't want to get too gross Ooh, but like metallic a little metallic like blood. Has, yeah thank you okay i was like i don't want to be oh. too gross but yes it's like yeah it's like the hematics of blood like when it when it oxidizes and then it's just not worth it so Ooh. so the bigger the wine um, usually if it's got a little more alcohol content, it'll, it'll go a little longer. It'll last a little longer. Um, if, if it's a white, um, some whites last a little longer than others, depending on kind of how complex they were. 
some, a lot of wine gets better even after a day or two. And I, I, I'm kind of, I'm venturing a guess that the, these will, well, I, don't know, I didn't try this one, but I believe, okay, so this is not unlike looks wise. All right, I'm gonna pour a little bit more back in the other one because, all right. Color wise, color wise, they're much alike. So you can kind of tell a Pinot, oh, let's see, it's hard to, let's see if I can get it. You can, it has this beautiful, is it like a, if I can get, I like put a this Pinot light on. Noir? Yes. Is the Pinot Noir, it's still a red, right? Correct. So you can see it's got, Ooh. I put this on for a reason. It's not so I look better because I know. <laughs> so it looks see. good there. I can see it there. Yeah. So Pinot Noir for me, yeah, it's one of those grapes that you can really tell a Pinot. Um, Pinot Noirs are very finicky to grow. So they tend to be, better ones tend to be, you're going to pay more for a good Pinot because they have thinner skin, they require uh, much more maintenance to be good. So if you if you find a cheap Pinot, it's generally, it's gonna taste real plonky, bulky kind of, it just won't have that good Pinot character, but um, good Pinot is just such a blessing. It really, <laughs> it really, it really is. <laughs> If it's so Pinot Grigio, I guess this is more of a language thing, but Pinot mm. Noir is probably like a darker red, and then Pinot Grigio is a gray, or what you know, does so that? So Pinot Grigio is actually a white. It's a white grape. Oh. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> so it's a white grape, and it's called Pinot Grigio in Italy, and and mm. it can be called Pinot Grigio in other places as well. In France, it's actually Pinot Gris. So it's the same, it's the same grape. Oh. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, oh. which is kind of funny because some people are like, I only drink Pinot Grigio or I only drink Chardonnay. But it's like, oh, would you like this Pinot Gris? I don't drink Pinot Gris. It's like, no, you do drink Pinot Gris if you're in <laughs> France and you drink Pinot Grigio if you're in Italy or in the United States. Or um, Pinot Gris are really, uh, like if you go to Oregon, uh, they make fantastic Pinot Gris there. And you know, it's... Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. We have to ask Linda. Mm -hmm. So interesting. The flavor profile is very, very like. This one's even drier. It even has more tannins. It's more chewy. Wow. So <laughs> I w I'm going to have to look this up after, but I really, I feel that these two came from very near each other. Um, so bright. It's like, there's, it's so bright. And, and I, I, now I want to go back and look at what was the growing season like? Cause usually the grapes are picked and it can vary, but it's much the same as in the United States, like in California, it can range from picking in September to October, but it's like when fall kind of comes and they call it crush. So they'll basically just sweep through and and it's like, um, you know, it's like, oh, oh, we have all kinds of, do you see we have people asking questions? Yeah, oh, you said, Lin Linda said, oh. yes, Pinot Grigio is all I drink. Linda, you also drink uh, Pinot Gris. Uh, <laughs> oh, and Kathy's saying, what are the best groceries for wines? Okay, and the best wine shops for folks who want to experiment and try new things. In, fr in France, Ooh. like in Paris? In or France? You know, it, mm. Yeah, ask Kathy if she means, aw. Oh, uh, so speaking of uh, grocery stores and wine here, uh, there was a Fran Prix that I saw. It was supposed to be like anti-plastic, re reusable, um, like wine bottle. So you buy the wine bottle and it's glass and then you refill the wine using the machine. And I bought that once because I wanted to go plastic free as much as I could. But then one of my French friends was like, you're disrespecting wine. You can't just like pull it out of a machine like that. So, that's like like, a, what's your opinion on this? So the only yeah. issue that I see, yeah, the only issue that I see is a lot of times the quality isn't, and I have, I don't know the experience here as much because generally you can get better quality wines for a lot less money here. Um, 
And in the United States, what I've noticed is really hip places will have that. I mean, I, I lived in California for a long time. So when you, when you, when you live in the wine, the wine country, when it was like, I lived in like the Napa and Sonoma and you know, I, it, it those areas, obviously when you're talking about a hip yeah. wine bar or that kind of thing, you're going to get much better quality and you're, you'll pay for it. It's not cheap, but um, it's like, you know, boxed wine kind of thing. People are like, oh, boxed wine. I was like, yeah, I wouldn't be averse to boxed wine because really that wine, if you think about it, it's in this bladder inside this box. It'll keep for much longer because the air is not getting in there. It's just never really good. You know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. <laughs> really good. So I would be, I would like to know, like, let's go to this Fran Prix. I want to, I want to know, like, can you taste or, you know, because I don't know. Yeah. In the United States, you know, they have those things with those big machines where you can stick a card in and push a button and you get all these different kinds of wine. I mean, that's like a big thing, but not yet here that I've seen, but. Yeah. And like, I was wondering too, um, I know because here you can buy wines for like two euros to 20 euros or more, um, way more if you go into an alcohol shop. Um but I've seen like movies and stuff and like gone to, well, like about expensive restaurants where they have like a 50 year old wine that they bring to the table. If you just save a grocery store wine that's two euros for 50 years, is it going to taste as good as one of the 50 year old wines that are super expensive in a restaurant? Or what's the difference? So such a good question. That is such a good question. So <laughs> No, <laughs> no, no, but, but let me tell you why. So um, okay. you could luck out and, you know, uh, get a wine that you save for a while and just by luck, it ends up, you know, aging well. There are, remember a few minutes ago, I said, um, there are a few, a few components that make an age worthy wine. One of them is tannins. This is for reds. It varies a little bit with whites, but not too much. So it would be tannins. The um, the second really important component is basically the fruit quality. Was it ripe enough when it was picked, but not too ripe? Um, so tannins, mm -hmm. um, it, was it ripe enough? Was there enough fruit quality and acidity? So, and that's really, that's really up to a very, uh, to a winemaker or viticulturist. So viticulturist is who's in charge of um, the grapes when they're on the vine and a winemaker is in charge of once they, you know, once they are picked. And a lot of times, um, you know, a viticulturist and enologist or winemaker is, it's the same person, especially here in France, because it's a lot of smaller producers. Um, so if you, if you pick and you are optimal with the tannins, optimal with the acidity, optimal with the fruit quality and the ripeness, then you have the makings of an age worthy wine. Generally, and that you and you get those things a lot of times by really in the in the vineyard when you're going through and you're tasting and you're seeing okay, uh, I need to I need to cull some of these I need to pull some of the grapes off because if a vine has to support too many grape clusters, you're going to get kind of sub uh, substandard juice from the grapes. So so they'll they'll really get in there and manage. They'll be dry farming, which means they don't water at all, or they micro water. Like there's all of these different things. It takes a lot to manage um, a vineyard properly and get really good results and good yields. So you don't want too many grapes um, because they'll be whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you have to really be involved in all of that. And that's why, I mean, when you go and you buy a wine, a lot of times, you know, it's like, oh, that's kind of expensive. There's a lot, there's so much that goes into it, vineyard management and, and staffing. And like I said, the picking comes all of a sudden, it's like, oh, uh, we're picking, we're picking tomorrow. Everybody's got to get here. I mean, that it can be like that. They test it. They're, they're like, this is perfect. We have to do it right now. So because of all of that time, effort, resources, money that go into those types of wines, the age worthy wines, you're going to generally pay more for it. But again, you know, it's kind of crapshoot because you could have this wine and let's say you save, I mean, I have wines back in the United States that, that I've had since I got into wine and they were already old even then. 
um, because one of the places I worked, it was wonderful. We would get credit, like every paycheck we had credit that we could, uh, you know, explore some of the wines in the store. And I was just this newbie. I knew nothing, but I would save up, um, save up my credits and, and really go for some wines. And I, cause I was like, I, I love it. I want to, I want to hold these and see what happens. I mean, I have wines from 1988, like a Sauternes from 88 and we'll get into all that. Like how to, oh, wow. you know, yeah, yeah. I had, I mean, they're all dusty old, um, but you know those what would those, make you open them <laughs> i don't know i kept thinking when my daughter graduates when she, <laughs> but she graduated now she's in college maybe when she graduates college um and to be honest you know at a certain point like i had a really wonderful champagne that i kept saving and saving and finally i was like dad you know what just open this damn thing and it was a wednesday so sometimes wednesday is just the perfect day to open it you know hey today's wednesday well, it's Wednesday today. <laughs> it's always Wednesday somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so it doesn't I mean, what do you it. expect for like um, a wine that's really old that you're waiting for like your daughter's graduation or something? What do you expect it to taste like after 50 years? Like what's the end goal? So I some guess? wines, yeah, some wines can go, I mean, theoretically, not forever, but you know, uh, there are some incredibly well-known wines like here in France, you've probably heard of Chateau Petrus. That's like, you know, one of the most famous, like somebody will talk about, a, you know, a, a Petrus or whatever, or in the United States, um, like uh, Silver Oak is, is like a name drop kind of wine that ages and ages. So as a wine ages, um, mm. if it's stored properly, because that's extremely important, you really need to store, it has to be very cool. Um, you have to make sure that it just stays sealed. It doesn't have extremes in temperature. Um, let's say you have a, ca uh, a Cabernet Sauvignon from 1994. Um, that was especially 94, 97, 96, you know, 96, 97. Those were really good years in like Napa and Sonoma for cabs. So let's say you have a 1994 um, uh, cab from... Alexander Valley or something like that. At this point, how many years ago? <laughs> I'm like, oh, how, like 20 or something. Oh, <laughs> uh, where uh, it started out being 25. I know it's like, oh, it's a lot. So, yeah, I think it's like 25. So at this point, and it'll go even for a while longer, it, it is now turning when you pour it in the glass um, where it, when it was young, you might get this really dark, intensely burgundy red kind of wine um, that's very chewy and tannic, but it still has lots of fruits and whatnot. As time has gone on, when you pour it and you and you look at it, you'll see um, more of a brick red around the edge because it, what's aging it is oxygen. So oxygen is like a friend and a foe with wine. So um, you really will get like, a it starts to turn like a brick red or orangey kind of thing. And it's almost like, more becomes more earthy a lot of times except once in a while you'll open it after 20 years and it's almost spot on like it was when it was young it, it, it's that's the wow. such a beautiful mystery about about wine like you pop it and sometimes you just don't know what you're gonna get i mean there's a movie <laughs> you know the box of chocolates but i mean that that's what's so wonderful and sometimes you're disappointed but a lot of times you're just like whoa whoa totally not expecting that, you know? And wow. yeah, and whites, um, whites don't generally age as well, but burgundies do. A lot of times you'll get a, you know, a burgundy sauterne, like I was saying, I have an 88 sauterne from, um, it's not an EKM. EKM is like, that's like a, a very well-known producer. Um, something like that, um, they'll only put a, they'll only really make that wine in that year if it's gonna be good. So sometimes you can already, it, depending on mm -hmm. if you if you recognize, you say, okay, they may, like um, a lot of times port, like vintage ports, they'll put a year on it and they'll only make it if it's going to be, if they know it's going to be an ageable good wine. So it's like the, the more you mm -hmm. get into it, the more you realize like there's just this, like this tsunami of information that comes at you. But I mean, you know, it's not like uh, you're becoming a surgeon. It's like, you can't, you know, how you can't really go wrong. Nobody's <laughs> life's at stake. So it's one of those things that's just fun to, you know, keep going. Are we good time-wise? Okay, we're good. We're good. I wanted to show you this. Yeah, we are. Cool I mean, wine, wine is life-saving though. 
Yes, like I was saying at the beginning, one, a glass of wine, maybe even two, it, it kind of makes you, turns you into a poet. More than that, you tend to get kind of sloppy, but <laughs> no, but I mean, it really kind of, it's not just because it is alcohol. I mean, that's obviously, that has something to do with it, but it's just, like I said, it's just sort of the, it's all the tradition and the pomp and circumstance. And, you know, it's usually an event and you're sitting and eating, you know, it's this whole, it's just a whole culture. It's this whole wine culture and, and people make, make it feel sometimes inaccessible, but it is absolutely not. And definitely not here in France. That's the wonderful thing. It's so accessible here, you know, and there's not this weird, yeah, I mean, I remember, go ahead. I, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I um I read this. Um, it might not be true, but I'm asking if it's true. It's kind of it sounds ridiculous, but I read this thing that one glass of red wine a night is equal to an hour of exercise. <laughs> maybe yeah, maybe. For so I was like, oh my god, part. I'm just gonna drink a whole bottle. <laughs> <laughs> I got my I got five nights of exercise in. Bing, bang, boom. That's yeah. a fish right there. <laughs> and you can write some poetry while you're at it. I think the thing it, I, that must be, I, I mean, I, you know, not the physical aspect of it, but I think probably the, you know, when people um, exercise and work out and they get the, um, you know, that feel good thing happening, you know, where it relaxes you. I believe that's uh, maybe mm -hmm. Cause it, I mean, it really is a, yeah, I think it was to do with your heart as well, because I think red wine specifically is good for your heart tannins. or something. Yeah, and that's what they talk about with the tannins, because, uh, I mean, it's an antioxidant. Tannins are basically antioxidants, and antioxidants grab free radicals in your system. So, I mean, you can sort of, sure. I have a, I just have a glass of okay. free radical attackers right here. <laughs> I'm help saving myself. <laughs> Well, it's like you're exercising right now. Yes, I know. I thought I was feeling a little bit like fatigued from this. Like really, wor I'm really working out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I was like, so yeah, there, there's, um, <laughs> there's a great cheese shop down the street. Uh, it's called, I think it's Katon. It's like Q-U-A-T-R-E-H-O-M-M-E. -M -M -E. Their logo is like the best in the whole world. I want to do a blog post actually about, about going in there and they have they have a nice wine selection there as well but you just go in and there's all these beautiful cheeses and they're so knowledgeable about the cheese but they're also kind of knowledgeable to help guide you through um maybe what you would what kind of wine you want to pair with each cheese because some of those cheeses are just like oh yeah i have a there's a reblochon in the um refrigerator that which oh i have to take out because it needs to actually come up to temperature but um it it was like we had Reblochon a few weeks before, and I don't know if it was the same batch, but like the cheese is aging, and so you can kind of taste it. And I, and I tasted it, and I was like, this would take it even a different wine than when it was younger, because it was a little more floral and kind of sweet, and now it's got this this funk to it that I would have probably had it with a white, a nice, relatively full-bodied white a few weeks ago. And then now, now it's it's like strong enough it's like what is it for it's like fromage for it's got it's got like <laughs> like so I would, I would have it with a kind of a, a more um a, a red wine now that would really stand up to it a little bit more than that white but I'll see how this one does to it this may not even be this may not even be strong enough we'll see I'll do that for dinner or something like that I think I want it you know what I wanted to do I have Okay, before, oh my gosh, I, I, did, I didn't do anything, not a lick. Did I, not oh, a lick. really? I know. Oh, I did, I'm but, sorry, sorry. That's I'm interrupting too much. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> but I, what I did want to talk about, um, I did a blog post about some of my favorite places, um, wine bars here. And some of them are because of the exceptional service, some are because of the exceptional selection. Oh my gosh. I'm, Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. So I will tell you, so probably my favorite spot is called Chenu, and I know you know this area. So Chenu is on the Pont Neuf. Did I say that right, Pont Neuf? Uh-huh. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. really, yeah. When you it's come, right by Chatelet for anyone yes. who doesn't know. Yes, and so when you cross over Pont Neuf and you go to the left bank side, it's like three little 
shops in on the right side and you walk in and it's this narrow um, stone lined uh, bar and they're so friendly. They're, they love to talk about the wine, which sometimes it's not always, it doesn't always happen here. Uh, you can't always get somebody, they just want to pour the wine and walk away, but they love to talk about um, the different new wines that they have. And I've never had a bad wine there. Uh, my friends were visiting, uh, they were here February, I think. And we went in there and it was like a cold rainy night. And he, and um, I said, you know, this is my budget. I want a wine that we can all enjoy. And he picked the perfect wine. He came and talked to us about the winemaker, a young winemaker that's now taking over the family tradition. Yeah, it was just such a beautiful experience. And the cheese and the bread there is fantastic. They have really good, um, just savory, savory cheeses and a super good bread that is like perfect with wine. And it's so it's Shea New. Uh, and so I can actually probably, yeah, I'll do like, I have to type it everywhere, I suppose. But so Shane is one place. Uh, I'll have to do that after because I'm not paying any attention. Um, there's another place and it's Sauvage. Sauvage, um, it's been around a long time. They just did a remodel. So it's um, kind of hipper now, but you, it, there's a dining room, but there's also a, a bar that they specialize um, in natural wines. And I want to be able to do a show on some natural wines because that's kind of a new thing for me. Um, but natural wines are, are super interesting, super interesting. And then um, kind of the hip spot is called um, De Devon, I think it's called. It's like deviant, but De Devon. Maybe I'm saying it wrong. Oh, okay. Uh, and it's uh, small but the food is banging. It's so good. Uh, small plates, really well thought out to pair with the wines. And it's, it's very hip and very trendy and very cool, but actually really good. Um, some places that are like that don't really follow up with substance, but, but they do. And then one of what probably, did... go ahead. Sorry, I was gonna ask, what did you mean before about natural wines? Yes. So natural wines are, um, they are wines. It's a whole different process. I could get into that, but maybe I'll try to do the next one on natural wines if I can find some good ones. So that, so we'll do nat. We'll cover natural wine. Okay. It's a different process and they taste, it's almost like when you taste wine. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to a winery and, and, and the uh, winemaker will take a, um, a thief, it's called a wine thief and they'll pull out kind of a wine in process and you taste it. You, so you get to taste it before it's fully like mm -hmm. what traditionally completed, but it's got this really good, you, you get a little more yeasty. This, okay. See, I'm going to go there. Okay. I gotta wait, Tracy, wait. <laughs> yeah. um, the last place that I think is just charming and special. It's um, La Cava Michel. So uh, it's also very small, rustic wood, so warm. The proprietor is like, you know, he's got the, man bun or like the ponytail and it's kind of he's like you know kind of like cool hippie like parisian hippie kind of guy um the food is very tapas oriented and but also kind of spanish and even portuguese um and the wine the wines are again it's like i know he's tasted every single one of them i know he can tell you about every single one of them the food is so good the atmosphere is wonderful very convivial people are friendly and it's just an adorable it's like the out you see it from the outside it's like this cool bluish turquoise paint job on the outside and and it's like all the like i said warm wood inside and and golden light and it's just the kind of exactly what you want to experience when you have wine here at a wine Ooh. bar for sure yeah, yeah. i really want to go there because i love tapas and like i feel like that would be the kind of snack that i would like with wine because i'm one of those people that likes olives with wine Mm. you know oh yeah because I know usually it's like cheese and wine but like uh my friend told me she showed me like olives and wine are also amazing and I was like oh my god so many things you can pair yes with absolutely it. and especially with like you know he, he has like this the charcuterie there and really good bread and and yeah mm. yeah so yeah absolutely like all these places that I'm hoping because I don't think he's open yet because it's not I don't know when they actually officially open right now. Everything's open on terraces, like you can eat outside, but I don't, he doesn't have an outside space, I don't think. Um, oh, most okay. of I know, I've seen some makeshift outside places. So those maybe the they're selling outside now. Those are the best. I love, you just walk up and go, oh, I love this ingenuity. This is some French ingenuity uh, yeah. here. <laughs> 
Absolutely. Yeah. I saw one bar do that. It was like they had, there was a big national library on this side and then the bar here and they were the only ones. So they had a little outdoor place here and then four or five tables on the opposite side of the street in front of the national library. Oh, and I was good. like, wow, I'm surprised no one's noticing this. <laughs> I know it's like just a commonplace thing, I, I guess. I don't know. I, I, I look at it and it's like, it's just spectacular all the time. All these different, you know, uh, yeah, makeshift, absolutely yeah. makeshift kind of things. But so tomorrow I will see. I'm glad you. they're allowed to do that. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think, I think probably some places weren't exactly allowed to do, to do it, but they, they're getting away with it. And I'm all for that. Yeah. All for that. So I will see you tomorrow. <laughs> uh let's see tomorrow what time are we six or five tomorrow for 6 p.m 6 p.m uh, six, hour time. 6 p.m for visiting paris so noon eastern time uh and then nine pacific time yes mm -hmm. Is that right? and we're at visiting paris what are yeah. we going to talk about we don't know yet right it's a mystery um well we can talk about uh we didn't get everything last time <sighs> But then on Friday, we also have Spooky Paris. And then mm -hmm. Saturday, we have You're Going to the Marais. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, so Sunday, super excited we about have that. our writing one. So mm -hmm. I'm super excited about going to the Marais. Because yeah. it's I'm super excited about month. your Marais one. Mm -hmm. And if anybody wants to join me, hey, hey. You, basically, I'm talking. Yeah, I mean, I would actually love to join you on that. That'd be fun. Yep, that'd be good. Um, but who's in our audience? Because I think it's time. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for like watching us and being with us. Thank you so much, Tracy, for all your knowledge mm -hmm. on wine. I know nothing about wine, so I'm learning so much. Well, cheers. Here anytime. <laughs> cheers, Sante. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining me. And um, like I said, if you have any suggestions, I'm so happy to bring everything that I can remember. <laughs> in a glass, glass. I'm very happy to do that. So, see you next time. A demain, au revoir, uh, à bientôt, au revoir. Et bonsoir, bonsoir, <laughs> bonsoir, au revoir, bonsoir, bonsoir, bonsoir. bonsoir. Thanks, Alan. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, no worries. Bye. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye bye bye. <laughs>